welcome to the museum lecture series. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that all our speakers tonight are living and working on the unceded lands of the Boomerang and the Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So welcome to all of you who usually join us in the theatre at Melbourne Museum. And to those of you who have only just found us in isolation online, I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation and that you might join us in person when the museum reopens. So, my name is Beck Carland and I'm a senior curator in the Society and Technology Department at Museums Victoria. And along with Kim Moulton and Dr. Kate Phillips, I co-convene this lecture series. The lecture series showcases our collections, our people and expertise behind the scenes at Museums Victoria. Over the coming months, Why Models Work, this series, will bring into your homes curators, collection managers and conservators presenting detailed studies of models in the state collection that are currently on display in our wonderful new exhibition, Mini Mega Model Museum. And while Melbourne Museum is closed, we bring that exhibition to you via virtual tour. I sent you all a link to the tour in your reminder email last night, and I do hope you all had a chance to check that out. Each lecture will explore the models in more detail from the experts who care for them and use them in their work. Now, some housekeeping. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Zoom webinar format, it's a lot different to a Zoom meeting. Rest assured, I cannot see you or hear you. You are all safe at home in your pajamas and Ugg boots. However, this is interactive. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, if you hover over the bottom bar, a Q&A button. So as our speakers present, please do post questions for us. And at the very end of the session, I will facilitate a question and answer session. But do bear with us. We have over 270 households joining us this evening. So we may not get to all of your questions. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at LecturesMB. Now, our first speaker tonight, Matilda Vaughan, has worked with the Society and Technology Collections since 2010. As engineer and curator, she has been researching, documenting, operating and, and collecting objects that have shaped our world. She has worked on the restoration of the Great Melbourne Telescope and most recently, the restoration of the museum's historic working model case which is one of the most popular objects in the exhibition. So over to Matilda to introduce the exhibition as a foundation to the main presentation tonight from Kimberly Moulton. Thank you, Beck. Um, hi there, everyone. So I'm Matilda Vaughan, the curator of the Mini Mega Model Museum exhibition. And um, I, I just wanna switch you over to my PowerPoint presentation. So I'm about to share my screen. So I'm just, I hope you can, I hope you can see that okay now. So what you're looking at there is the entrance to the exhibition. And that's how it looked the day, the day, a couple of days before we actually opened the exhibition in December last year. And so obviously we can't be there. And I'm sitting at the end of my dining room table tonight and I hope you're comfortable somewhere too. So um, when we first began thinking about and looking at the mon models and miniature things in our collections, a question that was always on my mind was, why did this model get made? And for historic museum models, one of the answers is to illustrate a story and to focus the eye on an aspect of history or science or technology. And this provides some kind of three dimensional experience as part of that wider story. But that's not how they've been presented in this exhibition. The focus has changed to highlight an alternative aspect, primarily their relationship to scale. But alongside that, 
there is the inspiration of the model maker or the techniques or materials that they have used or the places and under what circumstances the models were made. The objects all offer some insight into the various reasons why we as humans may choose to remake the world around us at different scales. The models invite you to look closer, to, to look at their details and perhaps even provoke thoughts about the way your familiarity with or perhaps unintentional bias affects the way that you observe or what you think about particular objects. Now, I'm just gonna take you to the next slide, which is the exhibition space. So in this exhibition, it's been set out in three areas. There's an area for the objects that are smaller than in real life, and another for those that have been made bigger. And I'm quickly going to highlight six of the models in the area where everything, including the gallery it itself is undersized. That's what you're looking at at the moment. And in this, in this area, we're asking the question, why would someone make these things so small? And in this area, there are many possible answers and models have been grouped accordingly, although some of them may have more than one answer. And not necessarily the ones that we've provided as prompts. So the first one, so these, these, I'm going to be talking about two objects from the group for keeping skills alive. And Norman Lindsay was an Australian artist. He created oil paintings, watercolours, etchings and pen drawings. And he also had a hobby. He built model sailing ships. As a child, he loved the stories of pirates and seafarings, uh, tales of seafarers and faraway journey, journeys of discovery. And he was even given a small sailing ship model that was made for him by his uh, family's housemaid. In his 20s, he spent time in Sydney sketching the ships that he could see on the harbour. And in 1910, he went to London and he sketched the ship models in the Science Museum there. He met the staff that were restoring the damaged ship models and he was inspired to make his own. And he started with this one. He used these ship models to help visualise backgrounds for his paintings. He's made a total of 14. This was his first, and this is the ship that Captain Cook sailed, discovering new lands and making those lands known to his home country, England. In the museum back then, the model was used to highlight Cook's journeys, his relationship to the Australian continent, and its connection to British colonial expansion in the Pacific. So I'm just gonna switch to a close-up detail. Lindsay was known for how meticulous he, 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 how much detail he paid to, to making all the parts himself. But uh, soon after it was displayed back then in the museum, the model did attract controversy for its perceived inaccuracies. And although Lindsay defended this and stated that he had never set out to create an exact scaled model, and he really wished it, he had kept the model, or his hobby of model making to himself as his own private diversion away from his primary artistic practice. And so his view on the value for the museum of such a model was that it would help, in his words, to stimulate the youthful imagination. And the next slide is a miniature basket and that's Kimberly Moulton's hands that are holding that uh, treasured object. So this basket, Um, Eva Ponting is a Gunditjmara artist. She visited the museum a couple of years ago and was shown ancestral woven objects in our collection. And although she wasn't a weaver at the time, the objects that she saw evoked strong feelings in her and in her way, she learned a new skill and applied it to make objects that captured the way that she had felt when she saw those ancestral weavings for the first time and how she could keep those feelings close. She used natural grasses, natural light, no magnification, using a technique that has been passed down for generations, for thousands of years and adapting it and miniaturizing it. And, in so, and so she miniaturized an aspect of her culture that was special to her. And so she calls these, these bottles her bottled treasures. And she says that she didn't choose weaving, it chose her. The next slide. So now I'm going to be talking about two models in the for demonstrating details that matter section. 
So Cyril Noisette was a professional cake decorator who worked for Melbourne's very own version of Willy Wonka, Mr. McPherson Robertson, the founder of McRobertson's Steam Confectionery Works. And in 1934, the state of Victoria was commemorating the 100 years of colonial settlement in Melbourne. At this time, Cyril was motivated to make, in his own personal time, a replica in sugar of the cottage that Captain Cook's parents once lived in, which was exacting in every detail. He took measurements directly from the cottage and even the plants in the garden. I'm just going to switch to the next slide, which is showing a close up of the details of some of the plants in the garden. He went to the nursery that was nurturing these plants ready for transplant uh, to put into the into the um, into the model, and uh, his so his attention to detail really showcases his professional skill. So the next slide. This one uh, was made by George Browning. He made many natural and social history dioramas for museums. His model of the scene of the Eureka Stockade depicts the moment when the two sides are clashing. And the model shows numerous soldiers versus a smaller number of miners defending their makeshift and flimsy looking stockade. The moment is a chaotic, chaotic scene with forms and the landscape looking smudged and imprecise which helps to capture that rapid movement and atmosphere. So here the details are a bit blurred. The model, next slide, also shows the technique of force, what's called forced perspective, where the things in the background are physically made smaller to give them the impression that they are further away. And Browning also made life-size models, uh, life-size dioramas, with figures that were engaged in the traditional Aboriginal life. He made these, the figures in these, in these dioramas, he used copies of the 19th century life casts of members of the Yarra tribe of Melbourne. And those dioramas are now at the Bangaron Cultural Centre in Shepparton. And now the last two objects. This one, these ones are for the deep freezing memories. Carl Nordstrom was a Swedish miner who arrived in the Ballarat goldfields in the 1850s. The landscape and the industrial activity that he modelled was for a commission for the museum's first director, Frederick McCoy. And Nordstrom made many models for the museum and we still have 10 in our collection. This is the, last, the largest. Nordstrom built this model at the Clunes site using the available materials around him. And I'm just gonna to switch to a next slide, which shows some more detail. Each of the little miners, even the ones deep inside the cavities, look unique. It's as if their faces were based on the people that he knew. So he was very present in this place. His model captures the people and activities and his very immediate memory of that mining landscape has been now preserved. And there'll be more about this particular model in a later, lecture in this series. And finally, we go to Albert Lesouf and Caroline Cotton. They were children of colonial settlers. As children in the 1840s, they spent time on the lands of the Tongarong people, the Golden River lands, which at that time were under the colonial sanctioned protectorship of Albert's father. When we spoke with Uncle Larry Walsh, a Tungarong elder and a member of our Yulenj, he shared his knowledge of what he could see in this particular collection of miniature tools and weapons made by Albert. And in the scenes that were painted on the box by Caroline, he saw that not all the miniatures represented Tungarong design tools. There were designs of other Aboriginal nations featured. Now, it's not known if Albert was aware of this, but Uncle Larry believes that Albert and Caroline had perhaps unknowingly captured a very important gathering of Aboriginal nations, which included members from Southwest Victoria. The Lesouf's nostalgia and fond childhood memories of playing with Tungarong children and learning their crafts had been manifested in these objects, which they made as a married couple, as a married adult couple. The box and its miniatures were presented to European exhibition audiences 
as representing what they viewed with their prevailing Eurocentric and colonial gaze to be a souvenir of what they had thought was a disappearing and an unsustainable culture. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing my slide and take you back to Beck. And uh, she'll be introducing Kimberly Moulton and I look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Now I'm really excited to introduce our main presentation for the night. From my colleague, um, my colleague and fellow uh, senior curator, Kimberly Moulton. Kimberly is the senior curator of Southeast Australian Aboriginal Collections at Museum Victoria. She is a Yorta Yorta woman, curator and writer. Kimberly has worked in curatorial roles at Museum Victoria for over 10 years, working collaboratively with the Victorian Koori community and across the country. She was the lead curator for Mandela, My Life, an exhibition on Nelson Mandela at Melbourne Museum in 2018. And her practice works in decolonial methodology and the intersection of research, community-driven projects, contemporary art, and historical cultural material, which extends to both the museum and contemporary art space. Kimberly has written extensively for art and museum publications nationally and internationally. She's also held research, curatorial and writing fellowships across Europe, the UK, South Asia and America. Alongside her museum practice, Kimberly has independently curated in various art museums across Australia and the USA. In 2019, Kimberly was the recipient of the Power Institute National Indigenous Art Writing Award. Her presentation tonight, 250 Years, Continuance, Resistance, Revival, is a very personal and resonant zooming in on some of the objects in this exhibition and their connection to historic and contemporary issues. So I'd like to now introduce Kim. Hi. Hi. I am going to attempt to share my PowerPoint. Just one moment. Um, I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging country and acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Bunwurrung and the Woiwurrung living in Melbourne. And I also would like to acknowledge that I live and I'm speaking to you from Brunswick, uh, the lands of the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people. And this is a photo that I took on my morning walk yesterday, looking out at the beautiful Mary Creek. I'd also like to um, begin this lecture and I'd like to acknowledge that the first peoples of this land have cared for country, for kin, for waters and animals for tens of thousands of years. We've been here from the beginning. As a descendant of the Yorta Yorta people, of the James and Cooper families, I am proud of my culture, of my community, and the continuing cultural practices and connections to the country that we continue to have, as do thousands of First Peoples from across the country. Today, the 29th of April, marks the 250th anniversary of the invasion by the Crown and the landing of Captain Cook at Kamei Botany Bay in Sydney, as we know it now. This was a catalyst to where we are today. Changes that I'm sure that uh, were beyond our ancestors' imaginations. This change brought devastation, massacre, disease, and trauma to First Peoples. But we have survived and we continue to thrive. We cannot go back in time, nor can we erase the past, but we can reflect and remember, and we can learn and we can relearn the many different histories of this country. Today, Australia as we know it is still on sovereign lands of First Peoples, but many visitors have come and made this country their home. And through exhibitions uh, like we have at First Peoples at Bunjalaka at Melbourne Museum, we can share our stories, our culture and our languages with you all. So tonight I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, the objects that are in our collections um, and also talk about the models that are in, in this exhibition um, that Matilda has so beautifully curated, uh, and, but also sort of give a bit of a first person, um, first people's rather, perspective and lens on these models. 
Um, so tonight we're looking at the models, but I'm going to be looking at them through the lens of resistance. Uh, and I'll be sort of integrating collection uh, photos from Museums Victoria's First Peoples collection, quotes from our Yulenge uh, knowledge group, which are our community elders and community members from Victoria that are our um, collaborative knowledge uh, committee that work with Museums Victoria and collaborate with us. Uh, and also look at the, the models that are in this exhibition. So I wanted to talk a little about resistance. And as I had mentioned um, in my introduction, today marks a quite a significant anniversary uh, for the country. And, you know, it was the day that Captain Cook um, and his crew arrived into Kamei at Botany Bay on the Endeavour um, and that sent a huge uh, change um, in, our, in our universe. And the ship, the Endeavour ship that's in uh, the Mini Models exhibition, uh, Matilda spoke about the, uh, the maker, Norman Lindsay, and his um, fascination with ships and his meticulous ability um, to create these objects. But when I see this ship, I, I think about the, the invasion of our country or the landing of Captain Cook at Rockney Bay at Kamei. And I think about the different histories that we've had to endure and different um, experiences rather we've had to endure as first peoples. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, the other ships that came after this that brought us uh, over a lot of our ancestors as, as well, the, the convicts and, and different people that came out from all across the world that make up um, who we are today in Australia. But I wanted to share with you uh, some of the um, quotes that are actually from Captain Cook's journal. This journal is available through the National Library of Australia online. Uh, and they speak about that first moment. So when, when that ship arrived through the headlands, those headlands, and that ship came through, and arrived on the shore. Uh, and what uh, happened at that time was an exchange of, um, an exchange between the Aboriginal people and Captain Cook and Joseph Banks. And we see here the words, Wara Wara Wai. And this is actually uh, what the men yelled out at Captain Cook and Joseph Banks and the crew from the HM Endeavour, uh, which didn't translate to go away. It said, um, you're all dead. It meant you're all dead. Uh, and this, this was a warning. This was a resistance. This wasn't a passive um, situation at all. And it was saying, go away. This is, this is not your country. Um, and, you know, looking at this model ship, it was, it was really interesting to see the little mini boats uh, that are on, on the ship as well, that obviously were used to get closer into shore uh, and imagining this interaction between the first peoples of that, that cove and Captain Cook arriving. The first ever object taken from Australia was this shield. And this is uh, known as the Gweagle Shield. It was taken um, from Kamei, Botany Bay, at that interaction, at that point of contact. And Captain Cook writes that uh, shots were fired and it struck the man. Uh, and this is the shield that that man was holding. And the, uh, the crew at the time collected this shield. They also collected um, several spears that are now held at Cambridge at the museum there, Cambridge University in England. Uh, and this really started that legacy of collecting in Australia and collecting uh, for museums and the collection of First Peoples materials. So it not only has a, a huge um, history in terms of that legacy of collection, it also has a deep cultural significance to the Aboriginal people of 
Sydney, that we are today. Uh, and that hasn't stopped. There's that continuation of connection to uh, this shield, but also to the, the man that owned it and the descendants that are still around today. So it's interesting to think about this ship um, and its many histories and its many sort of ways you can, can view this point um, and look at it as in the context of resistance and look at it as a way of, um, you know, looking at our past and how we get these objects into our museums now. I uh, had the opportunity to see the shield on my very first trip to uh, England in 2013, which was a, a research trip. And it, it was quite a um, profound experience for me because it was the only, uh, that plus the uh, boomerang was the only object that was actually on display um, from Aboriginal Australia at the British Museum at the time. And it was in the Enlightenment Room uh, which is called the Enlightenment Room at the British Museum. And to me, this shield with a bullet hole in it, uh, it, it has such a strong message, you know, being in the middle and standing in front of that case and seeing that shield and knowing, knowing the history and knowing that that point of contact uh, was the catalyst, you know, to where we are today uh, for good and for bad. Uh, you can see here a, a close up um, of this shield. And you can actually go online to the British Museum's website and, and view this object. And they've also done x-rays of the shield and detailed studies. Uh, and they have found that the, the hole is in fact um, uh, caused by trauma to the object, not through natural. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting to, to go onto that site and, and look at that. Um, so, it's, it's really been interesting um, engaging in these objects in a really different way, working with Matilda and bringing them um, into the exhibition um, in, in quite a playful way and, and, and really thinking about the, the maker and, and the, the visitor experience. Um, when I was writing this, this presentation tonight, I really wanted to kind of interrogate uh, these objects a little bit more, um, particularly in, in a way um, of kind of looking at the, the history of 19th, you know, in the 19th century, early 20th century of collecting Aboriginal objects, but also the, the taking and also the, the replicating of Aboriginal objects. And the Lesouf uh, box, as um, Matilda had touched on earlier, uh, was made by Caroline and Albert Lesouf. And they had, um, they were living up in the Goulburn region um, on Tangerong country and Tangerong are uh, um, uh, a clan and they are uh, one of the five language groups of the Kulin Nation. And um, uh, Caroline and Albert, you know, as, as Matilda had um, explained earlier, had been living up there, had grown up there. Uh, and also Albert was the son of William Lustoof, who had been the assistant the protector of Aborigines in the area in around 1843. And so they had a relationship with the Tonga people and First Peoples that were going up to and, and connecting into that region. And they had obviously seen a lot of the cultural materials that were being made and the ceremonies that were occurring um, in that region at the time. And this was also really at the threshold of quite a um, aggressive European settlement of that region. Um, there were massacres, there were terrible things happening to the First Peoples being displaced um, in that area because of the, the squatters and the settlers um, coming into that space. Uh, so it's kind of uh, depictions, we'll keep going through. Um, of, of these scenes as well. And um, as Matilda had said, she had worked with Uncle Larry Walsh, who is a Tangerong um, elder and knowledge keeper and also um, a uh, Yulang member for Museums Victoria and an honorary associate for Museums Victoria. And he spoke about um, 
that the the ceremony that they, they were sort of depicting on this box uh, is called a gay up or bag up and it's when groups come together and so you see these beautiful detailed illustrations um, on the box uh, of, of this time and of these ceremonies coming together and of the environment as well it's quite an interesting look at the, um, the environment that was at the time up there. Just going, just going back to the, the earlier slide, the, the different um, objects that we have here are various shields and boomerangs. We have different clubs. Um, we have spears. We also have spear throwers. So it's this whole toolkit of the Southeast really. And as Uncle Larry had said to Matilda, some of these objects uh, were in fact uh, from Tangerong country, but others would have been um, used around the Murray River region and other parts of Victoria and potentially even New South Wales. Um, so, you know, not all of our objects were the same. Our, like our language groups in, in Victoria, there are over 38 different language groups um, in Victoria alone. And of course, the diversity of our languages also meant the diversity of our culture. And so this is an example, albeit made by a non-Indigenous person, uh, of the, the sort of diverse range of different um, cultural materials and styles of boomerangs or spears or shields um, that we do in fact have. We have other objects from the Lesouf um, family in the collection. Uh, that also speak to a First Peoples history. And this was a painting um, by Caroline Lesouf, uh, I think in around 1895, of coming together um, of the Tangrong people and also the, the neighbouring clan groups um, of that area. And they're, they're really beautiful, um, sort of evocative, images of our people coming together and the ceremonies, the coming together for law, for marriage, for lots of different reasons. Uh, and people would travel, you know, to come together and do this. They would also come to Melbourne um, and connect as well and have major um, sort of ceremonies. Uh, all the five nations of uh, the Kulin Nation would come together. It's interesting to think about um, replication and uh, making models in the age of uh, copyright as well. You know, now we have um, there's intellectual copyright that Aboriginal people have, uh, and I would argue that that our our people back in the 1800s had that as well. Um, however, now you know people cannot uh, make cultural material or um, create work, um, you know, Aboriginal art, if, you know, they're not Aboriginal. And um, it's interesting to think about this box in the context of that. And um, you see in this quote, Uncle Larry, you know, sort of speaks to that and that idea of consent. And, um, you know, perhaps if, uh, you know, Albert Lesouf had um, spoken, you know, in, in more detail to the people that he was, um, you know, making these objects from, he would have understood that, uh, in fact, these objects aren't just located to Tangarong, from many different people. Um, so it's a, it's a really fascinating object because it tells so many histories. It's this history of this family, the Lesu family, and their connection to country, their connection to where they grew up, where they settled, uh, that detailing their relationship that they did have with the Aboriginal people of that region. Um, but it also gives us an insight into that time and the ceremonies that were happening with the First Peoples of Victoria and the objects uh, that were being made. But of course, we at the, uh, at the museum have uh, lots of the real deal uh, objects from the 19th century and some of these have been collected um, you know we've been a collecting institution since 1854 so some of these came in 
Uh, not too long after that, many came in around 1888 when there was more of an interest um, in collecting Aboriginal cultural material. Um, but part of my role as a, um, a curator at the museum, but also as a, a proud Aboriginal woman, is to also address the, the gaps in our collection and look at the communities that are still making these objects because our culture is continuous and it's not just within the historic past with these cultural objects from the 19th or early 20th century, but it continues on. Um, so in this case, um, which is the, the central photo, uh, we see here an example of that continuity of culture uh, and also looking at shields as a symbol of resistance. And going back to this narrative or this theme of resistance, you know, in terms of that first resistance on the beach at Botany Bay, the dropping of the shield and the taking of that shield, um, you know, we, we move into a space where the settlers are connecting to Aboriginal people and they're replicating these objects because they find them fascinating. And again, you know, also in, in some um, way, uh, Aboriginal cultural material was seen as potentially, you know, the trophy of the, the frontier or, um, you know, something that uh, is going to end very soon because of the, the way that um, Aboriginal people were treated at the time in the colony. Um, but then we also have objects um, in this um, case now that speaks to that continuity of culture. So we have shields that were made uh, in 2013. We have shields that were made in 1888 and they sit by, side by side. And this display is actually at First Peoples um, at, at Melbourne Museum in the Bunjalaka Gallery. And it shows also the diversity of who we are. So if you move uh, from the right hand side they're rainforest shields from far north Queensland. And you move across the country as you look across this beautiful case. So you have uh, rainforest shields, you go from Queensland through to New South Wales, to Victoria in the middle, to South Australia on the left hand side and over to the west. And so you see the diversity of, uh, of iconography, of, sh of shape, and this is specific to not only the region, but also the uh, maker and the cultural uh, connections that that maker had to country and to kin. Um, and, and shields have been, you know, a form of resistance and a form of cultural continuity forever. And we still have uh, makers today making shields, uh, painting shields, some people, some Aboriginal artists are making them out of steel now and they're in a gallery. Some artists are making them steel out of wood and cutting them down from trees um, and keeping them at home just to continue that practice. These are two shields um, also from Museums Victoria collection uh, that we are custodians of. And one of them is from the Wurundjeri people um, and this was collected from Healesville. And another one uh, on the right hand side is a broad shield. Uh, so there's two types of shields. There's the parrying shield, which is the one on the left, which is a very thick um, she used as a weapon also. And then there's a broad shield, which is the one on the left. And that could also be used in combat um, and also dancing uh, uh, in, in sort of ceremony and, and for different uses as well. The designs, as I said before, were very unique to the owner. And so it was a map of one's identity. And this case actually in First Peoples is called Marking Identity. So I wanted to speak a little bit now about um, the Captain Cook's Cottage in the context of objects and place. and place. Um, this cottage uh, was, was made in, in 1934 and it was for the centenary of Melbourne. And let's go to another country, another image, sorry. Um, there we go. So this is made out of icing, which I find like completely wild that we still have this icing uh, Captain Cook's cottage in our collection. 
Um, but even that someone went to the trouble of, of making this um, is, is quite amazing. Um, but also believable because, you know, centenary was such a huge thing in Melbourne. It was celebrating 100 years. Um, there's actually even a, a cake made that weighed tons and tons and thousands of pieces of cake were cut and given to the public. So like clearly cake and icing and, and it, maybe it was a bit of a theme going on as well. Um, but it, it was a fascinating history. Uh, but it also, you know, for Aboriginal people uh, was another kind of, um, you know, reminder of their land being colonised and their displacement from their country, but also their culture. Um, and Captain Cook's Cottage is, is a very interesting, or I went there a few months ago actually for some research, and it's actually in fact um, his parents' cottage. So Captain Cook never actually lived in this cottage. Uh, his parents did. And uh, in 1934, as part of Melbourne's many celebrations, uh, this cottage was packed down brick by brick and then sent over uh, to us in Melbourne and then it was put together again. Um, and it still stands today as a uh, kind of memorial uh, and kind of commemoration of colonisation of this time. And it's on cool and country. And this is something that we must remember. So, uh, you know, it can be a, a symbol of aggressive colonization on, on country. Um, but it also, it speaks to the notions of national identity at the time uh, in Melbourne that was so closely linked to England. And many people do still connect to this history. This is besides, you know, it is, is that bring um, both trauma, but also history and connections. Um, this is a constant reminder of, of, of that time. Um, so it's very interesting that we have this, this sort of meticulously made um, icing, Captain Cook's Cottage in the collection. Um, and we must remember that, you know, just up the road from where Captain Cook's Cottage sits today um, is where we have the Tandarum ceremonies in Melbourne. And if you have not heard of that before, it's been running for the last four or five years, I believe, um, to coincide with Melbourne Festival. And Tandarum is a ceremony that uh, happens and continues to happen um, whereby it was a way of crossing onto country. And so the Kulin Nation would hold Tandarum and, and Tandarum, the forms of Tandarum happens um, all across the state. Um, but there was essentially protocol um, that meant that you could cross onto someone else's country. And as I mentioned before, you know, I'm living on the, the country of the Wurundjeri people and also Melbourne is country of Wunwurrung and Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung people. And so there were certain protocols that had to take place for you to come onto their country. And um, now today we have this Tandarum ceremony every year um, this year, unfortunately, we won't be having it, but you can actually go in, um, online and, and look at the beautiful photos that have happened over the last few years. This, this image was taken by Stephen Ryle. And um, I get a sense of what this ceremony means to First Peoples today. So we're still practicing culture and we're still practicing um, our sovereignty on these lands, albeit over concrete and amongst the city and living um, with all the people that have come here now um, then call Australia home. So just to further um, talk about this idea of uh, two sides of history, uh, the Eureka uh, Stockade um, diorama and model is, is really interesting. And uh, as Matilda had mentioned, the Eureka Stockade, 1854, it was the rebellion of the miners. And, um, you know, in of the morning of December the 5th, uh, they were attacked and, and three miners died. And it's this huge story in um, the nation's history. And I even have memories as a child, you know, um, I grew up in Shepparton and, and some of our um, school excursions would be to um, Ballarat and to, to learn about this, this history of the Eureka Stockade and this massive rebellion. 
but we don't get the other side of history. And uh, there are two sides always, or three or four or five, or however many sides to history. And um, one elder who is uh, an amazing artist as well, her name is Auntie Marlene Gilson. She actually uh, is an incredible painter and she um, uses sort of multi-figures in her paintings and she repositions the colonial history of the past by reclaiming and recontextualizing the representation of these historical events. And here she's painted the Eureka Stockade, but there's also a story that her grandmother um, has passed down to her that came from her ancestors. And actually what was happening also during the Eureka Stockade is that the Aboriginal uh, camps and the, and the men and women that were on the fringes of the town looked after a lot of the non-Indigenous children um, that were, you know, had, had parents that were a part of the stockade. Um, and you can see that depicted in, in her um, painting here that um, while the stockade's happening, some of the children are being cared for um, outside by the Aboriginal people of the town. So, you know, that's a fascinating story um, and another part of history when we're considering, uh, you know, these models and, and this history that we know. And this, this painting's actually um, at the Art Gallery of Ballarat. Uh, but Annie Marlene and her daughter, who is in this photo here too, um, Deanne, who's also an amazing artist, uh, they are Wadawurrung people and uh, traditional owners of, of the region. Um, and they've done a lot of research in Museum Victoria's collection. So this connection to historical material and the past um, is very important uh, to our contemporary artists and our contemporary making as well. Um, just to kind of finish up, because I know um, we're going to have some Q and A's, but I wanted to talk a little bit now about continuance and revival and to talk about these beautiful baskets made by Eva Ponting. Um, and I think this um, quote here by Brendan Kennedy, who is an, uh, an amazing maker himself, um, and he says, showing our culture will enrich everyone's culture. And that's something, you know, that, that is uh, really important to um, us at, at Museums Victoria in terms of centering First Peoples and everything that we do. And the First Peoples Gallery is such an important part of the work that we all do. Um, and especially me, I'm not biased because I'm a curator in that department at all. <laughs> um, but it really is um, an, a, a privilege to be working with um, these objects and with our communities. And these baskets, um, I worked with Eva, the artist, in acquiring for the museum last year um, and also to, to go into the mini show. Eva um, is a Gunachamara artist. Uh, she's based in Shepparton and she's been weaving for a really long time. And she had come into the museum for many years, over many years, um, to research collections. And this is an image of her in 2013, looking at some of the shields in the collection. But Eva was particularly interested in uh, weaving. And um, here we have a, a, a 19th century um, basket from the Western districts. And this is just one of the many objects that Eva connected to in her time at museums, um, at Melbourne Museum to really connect to the hand of her ancestors. So look at the weaving, look at the technique, look at the grasses, look at the, the thickness of the grass um, and really embed that into her own practice. And Eva has been making, uh, sorry, we'll just go back. Um, these baskets um, based you know, on, on the baskets of her ancestors um, for many years now. And she's quite, she's a master weaver of Victoria um, and now is passing on her skill to many weavers um, in Victoria now. At the Melbourne Museum, we have incredible baskets. We are lucky to take care of these baskets, some from Corinduk Mission from Melbourne, um, which was out in Healesville. We also have a basket made by a lady called Troganini, who was a Tasmanian uh, Aboriginal woman uh, Pakana woman and you know we're very privileged to currently be the custodian of this basket 
um, and tell this story. So weaving and um, baskets are an incredibly important part of our history, particularly with our matriarchs and our, our women. So Eva, um, in talking to Eva about her work, and, and this is us up at um, Gallery Kayila or Kayila Arts in Shepparton, and Kayila Arts is a, a, a um, art centre in Victoria. It's actually one of only two Aboriginal art centres in Victoria, and they um, have you know, about 60 or more artists on their books from the Shepparton region. Uh, and Eva works out of there, and she also teaches um, there and at Shepparton Tafe. Uh, and these are some of her baskets sitting with us, but also. Um, her little mini baskets she started making and these are the size as you can see of well, smaller of, than my fingernail um, they're incredible and she uses uh, a raffia and she uses the um, coiling technique of the southeast um, and she has some secrets that we don't know about um, to make them and she puts them in these bottles and in, in talking with her about that, she said, you know, it's about um, treasuring these objects. And the intent also was to be able to wear the, the basket around her neck. So this was sort of the reason for putting them in these little vitrines was um, not, not for display, but to actually treasure them and to, to have them really close to her, which I thought was a really beautiful thing. Um, and another part of the reason, bring what's behind, as in what's behind, you know, in the collections of the museum that people don't see and bring it out into view. So the techniques that you see in these tiny little mini baskets um, are in fact, you know, the techniques that the ancestors have taught her through connecting to the cultural material um, in the museums, uh, but also connecting with other weavers and, and sharing practice, of course, um, in that space. And Eva just recently had a exhibition at the Koori Heritage Trust. Um, so this is from a few months ago um, at the Koori Heritage Trust. Kayla Arts had a, a show there and she's um, an incredible weaver. So we're, we're really lucky and privileged to have um, Eva's baskets um, now at the museum's collection um, forever, hopefully. Um, and we can learn a lot, you know, from the contemporary makers that are continuing the practices of our old people. So just to wrap up, um, if you are interested in looking at any more of these objects, Museums Victoria has collections online. And we have many objects from the First Peoples exhibition on tour of First Peoples uh, Gallery as well. And um, so maybe after you do a tour of the um, Mini Models Mega Exhibition, um, you can jump over and have a look at First Peoples Gallery as well. So I'm gonna wrap that up there now and stop sharing um, and hand it over to Beck, but thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, that was great. Uh, so, we had some questions in during the session, as I thought we might. We've answered as many as we could, but there are some for our panellists. I'm going to invite both Kim and Matilda back now. I'm going to... Here we go. I think we have them both back now. Hi. Hi. Great. Um, okay, so our first question... Um, actually came from Gordon White. Um, it's for you, Kim. Um, Gordon. <laughs> Gordon, Gordon asks, is perhaps the comment from Cook's diary, um, you're all dead, refer to the white skin of the Cook voyage and the possibility that first people may have seen the sailors as ghosts? That's right, yeah. It's actually... Um, it's actually a really good article that's come out today um, speaking about that uh, and that's where that quote directly comes from so um, it wasn't it wasn't sort of a threat um, to to kill it was uh, interpretation of what they were seeing um, coming out um, on the ships and the thought that the, perhaps there were spirits um, coming you know to that space but the I guess the interpreta interpretation of um, that word by um, people on 
the endeavour had been that it was um, go away. And so um, now, you know, with all the, the language revival and also the um, First Peoples of um, Khmer and La Perouse, um, they're kind of rectifying history um, and correcting that sort of language and that, that um, yeah, the way that sort of uh, things were interpreted, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I have a general question here from Teresa Savage. I think it's aimed at you, Kim. Um, what is the difference between the objects on display at the NGV and those at the museum? Okay. Um, well, the objects on display at uh, the NGV, um, some are more contemporary and uh, probably more, have a more of a, a contemporary art focus. So you've got paintings, photography, sculpture. Um, they do hold a, um, a collection of 19th century material, but it's also positioned through the lens of contemporary art and the aesthetic. So it's, it's looking at the iconography and the artistic um, technique of the object as opposed to perhaps how we um, display and, and talk about objects at the museum with community, uh, with First Peoples voice and through a lens of, of history, but also, you know, what that object is in terms of its make. Um, I think there's like lots of um, synergies, you know, and, and with uh, what's on display at the NGV. And when we talk about Aboriginal art and Aboriginal uh, culture and history, um, it's really all one. It's, it's all one continuous kind of flow. Of course, things were made at different times. Um, however, you know, there, there's not such a, I think when you talk about contemporary and when you talk about traditional, it implies a break in culture in some way. Um, and so I think what we have, what we see at the NGV might just be a little bit more recent. Um, but in saying that, we also have a, a huge amount of contemporary works at Melbourne Museum and that's part of our our core business is to also represent living culture and the continuous culture that we have today. Thanks. That, that feeds really nicely into another question about contemporary practice. Um, we have someone asking, how do, does Eva use any tools to make the miniature baskets or is it all just a technique? It's, a, it's just a technique, but there are some things, there are some secrets that we don't know. <laughs> so she's, um, yeah, she's keeping certain things about the way that she makes her, her baskets to um, herself. And that's, that's okay as well, because sometimes, you know, our, our knowledge as, as Aboriginal people in the way we weave or the way that we make things um, doesn't have to be, you know, all out in the open either. So some things are sacred and some things uh, are kept um, as personal knowledge or cultural knowledge. Thanks for that. Um, Matilda, Henry Buckingham asks, is there an important distinction between a model and a replica? Mm, that's, a good, that's a good question. I, I guess I would see a replica, if I was, um, for my view, um, a replica is really almost an exacting copy, but a model can be a little bit broader and at, uh, in, in terms of how exact and how to scale it can be. I would use an example like a, a miniature um, engine model where if you want it to be working and you want to be able to oil and lubricate it, you can't actually make the little lubricators as small or to scale to the model because you'll, you'll need a, a tiny, tiny needle to, to lubricate it. So. Um, that would that's the, the distinction for me a replica could be like a an exact uh copy of the real thing great actually there's a question from your husband matilda stuart asks what's your favorite model in the exhibition and i think we'd all like to know that but he knows i'm well it probably changes every time i, I speak to whoever i speak to but i'm pretty like there, there is a beautiful model. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's. I'll call it a replica. It's a, um, a miniature. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a, an octopus. It's called the musky octopus. It's beautiful. It's made out of glass. It's about this big, so it's a life-size uh, model replica. Um, it was made uh, in between 1865 and 1880 by a father and son uh, artisanal uh, expert glassmakers. And the reason I like it is because 
it, it's looking like it's just about to go across the, 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 the shelf. Um, so I think it's, it's and, and also knowing that the technique that they developed to make that particular model is now lost. That's great. I know that the next lecture, next month, we have an expert coming to talk about the Blaschka models. So another shout out for everybody to join us next month. Um, during your introduction, Matilda, you mentioned um, the life casts and Barry Harridge is asking, can any of our speakers tell us a little bit more about what were life casts um, and does the museum still have them? Kim, I think that one's for you. No? Not interested? Yeah, I have to say, that was a very surprising thing to learn that people took, uh, I'm assuming they're just as perhaps a, an artist would do today or a sculptor would do today, they're taking a, 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 a um, impression of a, a live human as opposed to those death uh, With less agency on the behalf of the person. Yes, came. of the sitter, yes. Yeah. Um, we do have some other casts in the collection that come from Corin Dirk. Um, and this was a practice by anthropologists, some anthropologists at the time. Um, and yeah, I, like you said, Beck, I think that the, they're, they're quite unpleasant objects in themselves because the agency of our people, um, yeah, was not there. The, the positions of power um, obviously weren't equal. And so we uh, choose not to display these objects. The, the casts that were mentioned, um, uh, Matilda mentioned, um, some of them are at the, the Bangarang keeping place in Shepparton now. So that was, um, that was given to them. And um, at the time, Uncle Sandy Atkinson, who um, uh, sadly has passed away now, but was also a member of our Yulenj uh, committee, but he established the Bangarang keeping place. So he um, had uh, accepted those um, dioramas at the time uh, for that keeping place. But the, the collection that we have at the museum, we don't display out of respect uh, to the people um, that are depicted in those um, those casts, and they're they're kind of um, busts, essentially, of of people. Mm. Yeah. So on that note, um, Rohini um, is asking: Are there any models in the exhibition, or perhaps in the collection, objects that have evidence of sounds or ancient writing systems? Mm. Hmm. Good, good question. Um, <laughs> Evidence of sounds. Sounds yeah. of ancient writing. She actually says, thank you, Kimberly. Mm. It's made me consider the written Indigenous language. Do any of the models have any evidence of sound and ancient writing systems? I think our, you know, our, um, our writing and the way that we passed knowledge on uh, historically and continue to, but now we have also the internet, um, was orally. So through, through song and through language, uh, you know, and, and so much of that is continuing and reviving as well. There's a huge revival of, of language in Victoria, um, especially through VACL, uh, Victorian Aboriginal Corporation, Corporation for Language. Um, so I suppose in terms of, uh, things written in um, to like language written into things it's talking about like the the marking identity on those shields like the 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 marks on the shields the marks on our cultural material on our possum skin cloaks we have we have two historical possum skin cloaks at the museum um, from the 1800s so so all of these designs were our language because they connected us to country and they connected us to kin uh, so, so that is a form of language. I think when we speak about language, we have to kind of decolonize our minds and think outside of the Western paradigm of what language is. Language can be also the materiality of, of weaving and design um, as much as it can be the English, you know, written sort of text that we know now. Um, we have an anonymous question, but it's a really interesting one about um the protocol to gain permission or be gifted artifacts um, that go into museum collections, I suppose historically and contemporarily. I know that um, we deal with that on a daily basis in the historic concept, uh, 
but we are also acquiring material now. Mm. Speak to that, Kim. Yeah, um, so that's, that's part of uh, my role as curator and I work closely with um, other curators like Beck and, and Matilda um, in this space of, of collecting and, and ensuring that we're ethical in our collection. So we have um, quite a rigorous process of due diligence around collecting and provenancing an object. So understanding the history of that object and if there is any kind of uh, unethical history around that object, we, we don't collect it anymore. So uh, historically, uh, the museum, you know, received objects in many different ways. Um, in the 19th century, it was from amateur collectors, anthropologists, uh, things were taken unethically. Um, you know, the, the colony, uh, sort of the police force, different people were handing things in as they were finding them or taking them. Um, but, you know, now um, we, ha we have collections that come to us from private collectors, from community themselves, and we actively also, where possible, acquire um, contemporary or historical objects um, from people. But yeah, there's, there's a really uh, rigorous um, due diligence and um, we're also bound by, by legislation in Australia in the way that we collect. So, that's sort of how we follow. And of course, um, in terms of community protocol, um, it's also part of my, my practice and methodology is always involving our community and the, um, the community that the object might come from. Thank you. Um, Matilda, I have two questions for you. Firstly, what is the strangest model you came across in pulling together the exhibition? Hmm. Strange is pretty subjective because, you know, just about every model you see, what you think about it when you first look at it is different to what the, act what the actual thing ends up being. Um, I, I think sometimes strange for me is in terms of what the uh, model may be made of. So for me, there's a cork Colosseum, so a, a miniaturised uh, model of, of a, of, of a of the Colosseum in Rome that has been made purely out of cork and that particular model maker, that was the fashion of the time and it extends what to... What period was that, Matilda? Uh, 1775, so yeah, um, it's actually the oldest model in the collection. The fact that it survived, our conservator would tell you, is because of the innate can, um, properties of cork. So I, I think that was a surprising one and also another one was made out of animal bones and it's a a little miniature ship. So I, I thought it was strange to be sitting around making these beautiful ships uh, out of animal bones. That was a, from a, a French prisoner of war. That's wonderful. And also Drew Pettifer is asking, um, what, what do miniatures reveal that the original object might not? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I guess a, a miniature might have, has the lens of the model maker. So I guess what they choose to include or leave out. So there might be more on there or there might be less on there. So I, I think it reveals um, perhaps a little bit about the, the maker. Terrific. Well, I think that's where we'll leave Q&A for tonight. Um, we've had a very full program tonight and apart from a couple of little lags in the technology, I think we've survived really well. Um, I'm going to thank both of our speakers, Matilda and Kim, for their time and effort tonight. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Beck. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to seeing you again.